to talk to you today about how the paleoecological results sort of fill in with the comparative kingship project. Um, so we, we know today that there's been a lot of changes that have taken place in Scotland between the 5th and the 10th centuries AD. For example, oh, you've got the, you've got Pickland and you've got Dalriata in the 8th centuries. And then by the 9th to 10th centuries, 11th centuries, you've got the gradual formation of the Alba and you've got Norse settlement appearing in the Western Northern Isles. But despite this knowledge and despite the archaeology, the history, very little is known about how these societies function, particularly during political and social change. So the aim of my research in particular is to try and use the environmental analysis and combine it with the archaeology and the historical data to try and fill in some of these knowledge gaps. Um, oh, so I'm going to be working in Ireland and in Scotland and today I just want to talk to you about two of, I was going to talk to you about three sites but I think it might be a bit mind-boggling um, and overwhelming if I, if I do too much. Um, so I'm going to talk to you about the sites I've analysed so far and that's Iona and Rhiney. So to begin with, Rhiney. So Rhiney is located on the east coast. It was part of Pitland. It's surrounded by archaeological sites um, ranging from the Bronze Age in brown. You've got the Iron Age sites in blue. You've got medieval sites in red. Um, Barflat and Cairnmore are perhaps early medieval. Um, and Barflat's been is one of is what uh, Gordon was speaking to. It's the site in Rhiney which they've been excavating. Um, and it's believed to be a high status site. It's a fortified enclosure with evidence of metalworking. You've got the symbol stones um, and there's international trade. However, both the Bar Flat and the Cairnmorn enclosures believed to have been constructed around the 4th century, but both appear to have been abandoned around the 6th century AD. So why? Um, so using the environmental analysis, I wanted to explore what was the rise, how does the environment rate relate to the rise in prominence of these early power centres and how is abandonment reflected in the wider locality. So to do this we extracted a 1.85 metre core from this, it's very very wet, this is the worst bog I've ever did a core in, <laughs> it was absolutely freezing, um, but it produced a really nice environmental record. So we did high resolution multi-proxy analysis, so we did pollen, um, and this is pine for anybody that's not familiar with pollen, or um, this is canopods. <coughs> this is an algae, it's Botrychoccus, and we also did geochemical analysis. So the bog, or the mire, is located only about 500, um, I think about 500 metres away from the archaeological site at Bar Flat, which is about here. Um, so I'm going to sort of summarise the results. So we've got evidence from the record of both natural hydrological changes as well as human um, influence. The natural changes are perhaps best represented in the geochemical record and also the lithology. So if we look at the geochemical record, I carried out what's called principal component analysis or analysis on the samples, um, and the negative what's called the negative loadings, seem to be associated with the chemicals, silica, aluminium, strong, uh, zirconium, and so on, um, which are, these are um, chemicals that are associated with grains, so minerals, um, and associated with erosion or inwash. And this curve fits in really nicely with the sediment sequence. Um, as you see an increase in organic contents, the organic, the positive loadings, and that's associated with these chemicals, um, and these ones are actually binding with the organics, so they're not so when you see nickel iron here, it's not to do with metal working. It's, these are actually binding with the organics. Um, and it fits in really nicely with the peat. Um, so you've got a wet phase. You've got a period of peat growth where the, you've got um, aquatic pollen that disappear in this record. And then you've got another wet phase in the sort of modern sediments, um, as well as meadow sweet. This is a marsh. This is a natural indicator as well. But as well as the natural signals, you also have evidence of human activity. Um, you can see this in the sort of herb record, as well as the dung fungi record. And you can also, there's also high percentage, well, it's 
is not really high percentage, but for cereal pollen, uh, five, anything over 5% is considered quite high um, of cereals types. Um, there's a potential decline in cereal around the period of time where we see the destruction of the bar flat in the 6th century AD. We need to be careful because it's only one sample, so we, we shouldn't really say it's definitely associated with a crisis. Um, but we, what's really interesting about this sequence is that there's continuity in cereal farming throughout, despite the abandonment of the settlement. Um, and we might expect that because the Aberdeen land, Aberdeenshire landscape is a really fertile landscape. So if you have a period of crisis, you don't really want to abandon that landscape. Maybe other people are going to come in and do farming. Um, so besides the cereal pollen, there is a potential metal signal. Uh, we did principal component, this is principal component three, and positive loadings are associated with the chemicals chromium, nickel, iron, and I can't pronounce it, ytterium, ytterium. Um, so there is an increase around where the bar flat enclosure is occupied in the 4th century, uh, 5th century AD. There's maybe a decline, maybe, but there is a general increase until 700 AD, and then there's a decline. And then there's pronounced activity from 900 to 1400 AD. So this might be a metal signal. I don't want to say 100%. We also see evidence in the charcoal record. So there's activity again during the enclosure period. There's activity during the destruction period. And then there's pronounced activity from 900 to 1200 AD. Um, and this, I also looked at erosional indicators. Uh, CP5 is associated with zirconium, um, zirconium's coarse grain side usually. Manganese is associated with redox conditions within the wetland. Um, and the negative is, is, increase in negative is associated with the zirconium and <coughs> depleting, which may suggest an increase in the water table. Uh, but what this what it actually altogether means is that the burning events are causing erosion and water in washing into the valley, so a rise in the water table. Um, the, I also did another type of analysis with zirconium divided by rubidium. So basically that's just coarse grain size, fine grain, sand silts, fine silts and clays. And it is often used as another erosion indicator. And what I wanted to do with that is to compare it with the sort of anthropogenic indicators, the cereals and the dung fungi. So the cereals, there's no relation. With the dung fungi, there is a positive association. And what this means is that although the dung fungi may tell us that there's pastoral farming, it doesn't, the increases are definitely not associated with increased activity. It's an associated with increased erosion. Um, and I'm gonna quickly move on. So this is a summary of this analysis so far. Continuity in land, land use despite the abandonment of the enclosure in the 6th century AD, may be a decline in activity, so there might be a period of crisis, but we do need to be careful here with our analysis. Um, but there's also potential metalworking signals, burning events, which is associated with erosion, and there's increased activity between 900 AD to 1200 AD. Unfortunately, there's not much in the way of archaeology between this period. So that's the first site. There's not much time, 15 minutes, to try and go through <laughs> everything. So this second site is Iona on the eastern side. Many of you are probably familiar with this. It's uh, renowned for its early monastic society when St. Columba arrived in fi around 563 AD or thereafter. Um, it was excavated in 2017 by Ewan Campbell and as part of their work, um, well, Tim Mile actually took the pollen cores and I did the analysis, um, but they, I'm not going to talk about the monoliths today because I haven't got time, but they've also extracted a core sample, um, and so we did a detailed two centimetre interval pollen analysis on it. So we know from the historical records, the, the life of uh, Adoman, um, that it was, there was at least 200 years of peace and prosperity. They had arable farming, pastoral farming, and I believe that we can see this at the bottom of the record by the low tree representation clearance. You've got cereals in the record, you've got some dung fungi, you've got herbs associated with um, disturbance, herbs that are often associated with pastoral farming as well. As well as this, there was some beetle analysis. Um, so the, 
Enid Allison did the beetle analysis from one of the contexts, and it relates to around the same time period. Unfortunately, I didn't get the initial monastic period, the arrival period, it's shortly afterwards. Um, but Enid also identified human activity in terms of beetles associated with animal waste um, and beetles associated with um, building materials such as straw, bedding and dry rot. Um, unfortunately, the peace and prosperity, as mo a lot of you might be aware, didn't last in Iona. And I believe this might be represented in the pollen record as well, uh, particularly with the birch record. There's this gradual and then this really pronounced increase in birch pollen. There's a decline in the grass and there's a disappearance in cereal. Cereal, we have to sort of be a bit careful as well here, that cereal might have been swamped. Its representation might have been swapped by over-representation of the birch. Um, but it appears that there may have been a drastic settlement decline. Um, Boinks, in his analysis, also noticed... Um, an increase in birch, which he suggested might be associated with coppicing. So we, we should consider that possibility as well, but I'd like to argue um, that we do know from the annals that over a 30-year period, the monks were attacked on at least four occasions. Um, and in, on those occasions, a lot of the monks were actually slaughtered, a lot of the monks fled. Um, they may have fled to the monastery in Kells, um, and... I believe this is sort of reflected in this high representation recovery of the birch scrub sort of woodland. Um, but we do know as well from the historical records that the monks came back again. And this may again be represented by this, this strong decrease in birch. And we also see cereals reappear in the grassland as well. Um, but then we see another increase in birch. So it's not as strong as this period. And this, again, may represent settlement decline. So there's a lot of things happening around 800, 850 AD. Um, we know that perhaps the relics of St. Columba were moved between Dunkeld and Kells. The political status of the church changed. It lost its um, political power. Um, and so we know the kingdoms of Alba were forming at this point. So maybe the monks were sort of moving away um, you also still have the threat of Viking attacks on the island, and this may explain a decline in population. Although we see a decline in population, though, there is not abandonment of the island, because cereals do increase slightly. There's also an increase in burning throughout this period, and we also see increase in heather and Corylus myrica type, which may suggest people were managing the heathland during this period. So my hypothesis for this is that we may be seeing settlement decline, so people are abandoning the regional area, so allowing the birch scrub woodland to regrow, but they're, they're sort of concentrating more locally, um, and there's still this focus on arable farming, um, and perhaps there's some heathland management as well. Um, and we do know from the records that there are mentions of abbots in, An in Iona during this period, there's still burials taking place um, in the 10th century. And then finally, we move into the 1100s. And there, oh, there is a pronounced increase, pronounced increase in activity during this period. So this is the lowest representation of birch. You also see the highest representation of herbs, particularly the daisy and the dandelion family. Um, cereals are still there. Um, but Pastoral farming indicators become really pronounced during this period. It happens before the arrival of the Benedictine monks and the Augustinian nuns in around 1203, I think, AD. So what does this mean? Could this represent the medieval warm period where climatic conditions are getting slightly better and you can, farming conditions are improving? But what does it mean in terms of people? Does this mean that the monastic community, the Columba monastic community, are recovering in numbers slightly? They're becoming more prosperous? Or does this mean that we're seeing Norse settlement influence on the island during this period? Um, there was some excavations in Glade Farm, which uncovered some Norse artefacts, uh, believed to be from the 9th, 10th centuries AD. So there was an alloy pin, there was um, a whetstone, I believe, and other sort of pottery shards. 
There's also potential place names on Iona. There's a name called Feld, I believe, which it, it was um, destroyed in about 1878. It was a village of about 50 houses, which no, there's no evidence of this anymore, but it's recorded on Canmore. Um, and there's suggestions that this might be a Norse name. There's potential evidence of Norse settlement, but at the moment this is inconclusive. We need more evidence to either confirm either way who these people were that are influencing the landscape during this period. So I'll just sum up this now. So in the early monastic period, you see peace and prosperity. There's farming taking place, arable, pastoral appearance. Then we see the birch regeneration, which may represent a period of crisis, perhaps the Viking attacks taking place. Um, we see a return to farming. Um, so recovery, so maybe the monks are returning during this period. But we do see another decline in activity, which may, may represent a regional decline in landscape management and a more locally focused because of political changes and other sort of social changes taking place within the monastic community during this period of time. But then around 1100 AD, there's an intensification of activity prior to the Benedictine and Augustinian arrival. Um, but we don't really know. We haven't got substantial evidence to say who these people were at the moment. Um, and that's it. Thank you.